I recognise that there has been a surge of discontent this year, so I am really glad to be here today to talk about that and about any aspects of inspection and accountability that you want to talk to me about. Lord Knight suggested we needed to move away from a high stake system to one in which uh, Ofsted has a duty of care to people working in the system. Um, I take the point you've already made about yeah. high stakes not necessarily being the gift of the inspectorate and, and that being partly a policy decision. Um, but with regard to that point about a duty of care, what's your response on that? We hire inspectors for their bedside manner um, as well as for their knowledge and experience. We know that what makes a good inspector is somebody who can make the conversation about the person at the receiving end, not about themselves. Um, and your typical inspector is a very modest and a very conscientious person um, who unquestionably, by default, brings that, brings that care. It's incumbent on me as a, a trade union official to speak for our members and, and the harrowing testimonies that we heard from our members at our annual conference at the open mic, people who wouldn't normally come uh, and stand at the front and talk, um, was profoundly shocking. We've just run a few round tables as we gather evidence ahead of the uh, this year's pay round and that sort of thing. And I'm hearing the same sorts of um, issues about ill health, about stress. Our, our evidence, which again we are, are refreshing, you know, contains absolutely horrific findings that Nearly nine out of ten uh, teachers, uh, head teacher, school leaders, sorry, say that the um, their job impacts negatively on the quality of their sleep. Eight out of ten worry about fear or stress for their job. Um, inadequate time for physical exercise. Negative impact on mental health. So all of these things do need um, sorting. Um, and, but if we could do one thing, I think it would be for us to take the high stakes away from inspection. Um, you know, this is driving a a uh, terrible ill health crisis, I would come on to I'm sure later in the um, session, a terrible ill health crisis in our schools. Uh, it's an active deterrent to leadership aspiration uh, and it is driving a retention crisis in our schools that is terrible. You know, we even have schools now that are judged as requires improvement. Legally, these are schools providing an acceptable standard of education. In old money, they would have been called satisfactory. We could argue about the words, but no school leader should lose their job for being requires improvement twice. But that is what happens. So for a school leader, every time they have an inspection, they have that cliff edge about, is this the day that I lose my job? And this is just the same for their staff, because that drives the same um, stress and ill health and worry amongst all the people who work in the school, school leaders, teachers, and school support staff as well, all of whom are trying to do their very best for the school. So for us... The driving force behind all of this is let's take the high stakes away, let's support schools better uh, and support those that need to improve more and support those that are developing new things to collaborate better to do that. I think you've heard a lot about consequences from a lot of directions. A lot of people clearly do dislike or resent the fact that a poor inspection judgment can lead to a change of control for a school. And that's even though this DfE policy is clearly aimed at making sure that children's education is as good as it should be. Now, it's not new that people dislike that, but the introduction of the additional policy of intervention on a second requires improvement judgment is new, and it has clearly raised the stakes for schools and for MATS. Our members uh, as school and college leaders describe their week as one of two halves, Monday to Wednesday, where they live in fear of the phone call, genuinely in fear of the phone call, and then Thursday and Friday, where they can actually get on with the business of leadership. Um, and, and that's no way to run a system. Um, and we hear that time and time again. Um, and, and by the way, that comes from uh, school leaders who are running all types of schools, from inadequate schools they've taken over to outstanding schools. Um, so it is not a particular type of school that refers to. But I completely agree with Ian. Re reducing that high-stakes nature has to be the priority, and that doesn't just involve... Ofsted, and it is not purely... It, it, a lot of it comes down to DfE policy rather than, mm. rather than things which are in the regulator's gift. It, it, it's that. the implications yeah. of what happens after, after inspection, absolutely. The connection between intervention and inspection is profoundly unhelpful. 
Danny, anything to add to that? Yes, well, I agree with everything that's been said, but, you know, um, accountability systems that encourage uh, the greatest amount of collaboration internationally see the, the greatest amount of equity. Um, I completely agree, agree with the, the removal of the, the high-stakes nature. Actually, not much direct evidence about the impact of inspection or judgments on children and young people and on their mental health as well. But I think there's two key points I'd like to raise in response to that. Firstly, it's the changes to the school environment that Ofsted brings. We know that schools can be really stressful places for some students anyway, particularly those who have additional needs. They also can be really supportive and inclusive places where support is put in place and children can really enjoy school. We know that Ofsted is disruptive to the kind of normal school ecology and it can contribute to driving like a really high stakes environment within schools. It's adding additional pressure onto teachers and it's kind of perceived to be driving this narrow focus on academic attainment. So that would be my first thing is how is the changes to the school environment then actually inversely impacting children and young people. The second thing I think is teacher wellbeing. Um, we know that teacher wellbeing is really low at the moment. Um, the recent Education Support Teacher Index last year said that 75% of teachers are stressed. And now we know that Ofsted also has a massive impact on uh, teacher wellbeing as well. Um, and that it can add fear within schools. Teachers are really scared about being judged, about cr being criticised, and that can really add to their own mental health difficulties. If teacher wellbeing is low, then how is that impacting on young people? There is research to suggest that wellbeing does affect teacher performance, that young people are actually really attuned to how their teacher is feeling. So if a teacher isn't feeling well, we know it within ourselves as well when we're at working, if we're not feeling okay, we don't perform to the best of our ability. So I think it's the changes to the environment and the impact that teacher, the stresses it puts on teachers and then how that translates to mental, to children and young people. In terms of how it can be improved, I'm really glad you asked that question because there is, again, our member states of mind, they've done some work with young people to, to develop an alternative Ofsted framework. Um, they gathered some young people's views on the current Ofsted framework. Um, they found that inspections at the moment, from a young person's perspective, are not providing enough opportunity for young people to talk about their mental health and wellbeing. Um, young people found that teachers and students acted really differently during inspections. Um, inspections being too short, not giving enough time for uh, things to be looked at probably, uh, properly, and again it had that negative impact on teacher wellbeing. 